it's Sarah from Heart of Hearts. I'm here with my week of reading wrap up. This is where I talk about books that I read last week, what I'm currently reading and potentially could read next week based on my mood. Uh, so I had a very great week, uh, read a bunch of interesting books and completed some books that were kind of long tail. I kind of read throughout the entire month. Uh, so that's always a great feeling. Uh, so let's get into it and I'll tell you all about them. The very first book I'm finding really challenging to talk about. Uh, challenging because I, from a spoiler perspective and challenging from a sensitivity perspective. And I think that that's what makes this book so unique and compelling. Uh, this is Detransition Baby by Tori Peters. Uh, this is a bold book. It is immersive in trans culture, specifically trans women. The themes are identity and community and relationships. It's, there's so, so much here. Uh, it's bold. It's incredibly, incredibly thought provoking. Okay, so let me see if I can talk about this in a way that, that is uh, sensitive to the subject matter. At the core of this is a triangle, is a love triangle. Uh, and we have, we're looking at this from, the, from Reese, who is a trans woman. And she is dealing with the after effects of a failed relationship. Uh, one of her big, big true loves. Uh, she was involved with Amy, who was another trans woman, and it had a deep, deep connection and deep love. Amy left the relationship in order to transition back to become Ames. And so it, it's Reese kind of dealing with with that. Uh, is it a rejection of her? Is it a rejection of and speaking more about what Amy was going through, that they needed that 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 they felt that they needed to uh, live as Ames. Uh, what does tr detransitioning even mean? Uh, and that so already that is fascinating. And then you add another component to it, and the component is that uh, they that Ames started a new job, and in his new job. He started having a relationship with his boss, a woman, and this woman's name is Katrina. Uh, now, Katrina does not realize that Ames it used to used to live as a woman. Does not recognize that. Doesn't know, even know it. And Ames, what, they were engaging in maybe not safe sex uh, from a from a contraceptive perspective because Ames thought that the hormones uh, that he took when he was living as Amy had give, made him so that he was sterile. Well, he wasn't. <laughs> and surprise, a baby's coming. So that baby all of a sudden brings up all sorts of issues for all three of these characters in fascinating ways. Absolutely fascinating. Uh, so this book is so tense and it is so heart-wrenching. Um, and it is bold. It's messy. I keep hearing, seeing the word messy and yeah, it's, it is messy, but I think there's some, there's, there's a lot of truth that feels like it's, it's coming to the surface here. Uh, and I think it's very bold for Tori to uh, kind of put all this out there. Uh, I've seen some reviews where there are people in the trans community that are just like, Hey, you know, let's not, Let's not go there. We don't need, you know, we're, we don't need to be showcasing this. Uh, and I'm not the one to say whether that was right or wrong. That's not my, that's not my, um, my job. I will say from a book perspective, from a reader's perspective in reading this book, it felt immersive. I felt like I was in their world and all of the heartache, all of the hardship, how difficult life still is for trans women is front and center here. Uh, I thought it was remarkable and I am looking forward to seeing other people pick it up and start reading it. And because I would love, I would love their thoughts. Uh, next up, I had just a phenomenal read. This is becoming one of my favorite authors. Uh, this is Magda Zabo's Abigail, translated by Len Ricks. This is a, one of those lovely um, New York Review of Books editions. 
I read this with Natalie of A Curious Reader. And uh, number one, she's an amazing buddy reader. And I, I just enjoyed the experience so, so much. This book is phenomenal. Not, it, it's, it, she does these things when she writes where she can, she's like the full, the full package. You get uh, amazing plot. Uh, you get amazing characters, deep, deep characters. You get sense of place. You get uh, also interesting structure, interesting authorial choices being made in how she tells the story. And it, it's just phenomenal. So The Door is one of my favorite books I've ever read. Uh, that is by Magda Zabo. That was the first one. This is my second one. And I'm, I'm still enamored with her. This is the story of a young girl. You would think her name is Abigail, but it's not. Uh, her name is Gina, and she is the daughter, the young daughter of a general in Hungary. And the general recognizes that World War II is, is coming and that he is going to be busy. And so he takes his daughter and drives her all the way across the country to this very, very remote village, to this very isolated boarding school and in this boarding school it's like a fortress uh, and he leaves her there uh, and so you get the best that I love about boarding school stories which is you know like the rituals and the strange ways that that when you're in this cloistered environment this very tight environment how the bonds form and the tensions happen I, I just I love those experiences but on top of that you have the political ramifications of what's happening outside as well as how much the girls know on the inside. You get a, an amazing cast of characters in terms of the teachers and the people that work in this, this boarding school. And, uh, and there's a mystery at the heart, at the heart of it. Uh, it was sublime, superb, and I cannot wait to read more from Magda Zabo. Okay, then I read something entirely different. Uh, I saw Mel from Mel's Bookland Adventure talking about this. I love graphic graphic novels. I love the art aspect. I love the pairing of art and story. I think it's such an interesting way to tell a story. But I have not spent enough time with them. So last week you saw me talk about Heartstoppers Volume 2. Uh, this time it's Aya of Yap City. Such a great, great cover. Now, I made a mistake. I did not realize that this was volume two. So I went in and it was a little disorienting at first because you are literally just dropped in. And I realized, oh, wait a minute, this is in the middle of an already existing story. So I need to go back and read uh, earlier, the earlier bits. And I think I'm going to get a bind up. Mel was showing a bind up in her uh, uh, video. She did a live, a live video and she was talking about this book. Uh, this is by Marguerite Abouye and Clement Huberi, and it's set in Cote d'Ivoire uh, in the 1970s. So in the story, we've got Aya, who is our main character, and her two friends, and we get to see them and all of the choices that they're making and mistakes that they're making. We get to see uh, also the families and all the interconnections in the city of Yop. Uh, it's absolutely delightful. The art is amazing. I'm going to put up here some of the art because it it reminded me and gave me such feels of Maputo, Mozambique in 19, late 1970s, which is where I grew up. So I, seeing this and seeing the art and seeing the images, I, I felt, uh, I don't know, it, it took me down memory lane and it was absolutely wonderful. Uh, so this is a, a really great, uh, Really great story. The art is amazing, absolutely fantastic. I'm really enjoying the how, the, how funny these women are, and the, all of the the people in their in their town, and and the, the fathers and the mothers. It's it's a delight. So I'm going to continue on with this. Then I finally got to one of my long. Oh God, I've been so bad at NetGalley. I've been so bad at NetGalley. My percentage is like forty three percent. And so I, one of the things I'm going to do for next month is I want to go through a lot of, of the things that I've been kind of hoarding in NetGalley, and I need to start moving through those. 
So uh, I did grab this one. This is the girl in the girls in the picture by Melanie Benjamin. Melanie J- Benjamin is kind of like one of those luminaries of historical fiction, and she usually, I think, if I'm if I'm thinking of her correctly, she usually gravitates toward a famous person um, and kind of uses that as kind of her anchor. And so in this case, it's Mary Pitford and Frances Marion, who I knew nothing about. So it starts off as your, you know, you get your your two ladies who are older in life, and uh, there's been an estrangement, and and Francis is going to going to have it out with Mary and force a way into her life, and and there and then and then you go back into the backstory of how they arrived at this at this point of contention. You know, okay, interesting silent movies. I don't know a lot about silent movies. But I do know that I've been seeing Charlie Chapman appear uh, over and over and over again uh, in the Ali Smith Quartet, which I'm reading uh, with a group of, of readers, uh, buddy readers. And so, so I was like, oh, well, that's kind of fun. Let me, let me kind of dip in here. I, it, this book really started to turn me around uh, because we started learning about the silent film industry and how Mary Pitford and Francis Marion really just jumped in and, and took a DIY uh, kind of do-it-yourself feel and attitude and made things happen for themselves. They were the only girls in the in the picture. They were uh, directors. Marion became a writer. Uh, they Mary Pitford became one of the people that started a film company. Uh, just really. Uh, curious, interesting development that I just wasn't expecting at all. I never hear about the fact that these women were so such trailblazers. They weren't necessarily feminists. And what I mean by that is that although they were trailblazers, I consider a feminist to be someone who wants the freedom and liberation for all women, not just their own personal growth. And but they absolutely trailblazers led a path for uh, that other women were able to follow after. So it, it was there was a lot more here than I expected, and I appreciated that. You know, it was I still just liked it okay. Um, but if you're interested in silent movies, if you're interested in Mary Pickford and uh, Douglas Fairbanks, and or if you want to learn more about Frances Marion. Of course, from a fictional perspective, uh, then this this is a good thing to might be a good thing for you to read. Now, let's talk about a delightful book and one of the joys joys that I find in a buddy read or a group read. Uh, I read Cranford by Elizabeth Gaskell. This is my cloth bound Penguin Classics edition. I just think it's so beautiful. Uh, I read this with Hannah, Kim and Roz. I'll put a link to all of their channels below. And I loved loved this book. It was I thought it was delightful, charming, and lovely. Uh, but through the buddy read and through their observations and the conversations that we started having about it, I realized this is much more subversive and subtle and nuanced than I was giving it credit for. And it's not because I was doing just to, just uh, to surface a read, but uh, it was the conversations as to uh, the nature of how she constructed this book. So Cranford is the story of uh, a town, a, a little town in England. And this town is filled with spinsters, uh, older women spinsters and or widows. Uh, there are very few men in this town. And so men are really in the background. They're, they are not... They are not uh, the foreground in this. The women are. And she writes the women with such uh, interesting vantage point. Uh, It feels very real. It feels very uh, authentic. You know, that you have, but but fundamentally uh, running its course through it is love. There is a love and a connection and a sense of community and a safety net that all of these women have with each other. It's very clear that they all understand that what happens to one ha- could happen to the other, and they protect and take care of each other. And that is phenomenal. That you know, when you 
I love that already. But then you think about the time that this was written. Uh, this is a Victorian novel. It's considered one of the classics. It becomes even more uh, amazing for that. So I was joking that I was giving it a three, not because I thought it was a bad book. For me, a three is a very good book. And then uh, Kim convinced me that, okay, it should be a four. And then Roz convinced me, no, it should be a 4.5. And it's actually, now that I think about it, more like a 4.75. And I don't say five only because I don't know if I'll reread it. Maybe I will. Maybe I will. Uh, but this was a charming delight, much more here than at first glance. So, yeah. So that's what I read. Uh, let's talk about what I'm currently reading. Uh, still making progress with Marcel Proust, uh, In Search of Lost Time, Volume 2, In the Shadow of Young Girls in Flower, with my friend Leo of A Little Book Life. We're also making our way through this behemoth. This is The Eighth Life by Nino Harvishvili and translated by Charlotte Collins and Ruth Martin. We have two more check-ins and I have to leave this and start hitting the book because it's a big, it's a big section. Love still absolutely completely in love with this book. The magic that it is, is weaving on me is real. This is, this is a fantastic story. And her characters are dynamic. You, you start to think that you love them and you're like, oh, that's my favorite. And then something will switch. And so this perspective, this kind of tilting perspective as we move through time with other people is really brilliant. I, I think she's a great writer. Then uh, I'm, I'm woefully behind in my Invisible Cities project, woefully behind. So I, Invisible Cities is a project where we're reading from multiple uh, countries. Each month, three countries are chosen. So this month, it was Egypt, Colombia, and China. So I am reading The Chili Bean Paste Clan by Yan Ji, translated by, by Nikki Harmon. This won the English Pen Award. And I'm about halfway through. It's a contemporary novel, uh, follows a family, and a, uh, an adult woman is talking about her wayward father and how uh, he's kind of having a midlife crisis. And so we're, we're watching that as well as the upcoming 80th birthday of her grandmother and all of the things that are, that are starting to come apart in this family. Uh, uh, more to say on this later. Then I started this last night. This is Difficult Light by Tomas Gonzalez and translated by Andrea Rosenberg. Uh, the, I just love these art, archipelago little books. Uh, they do interesting sizes and the, the paper is just so lovely, so textured. Uh, this is a story, uh, this is for Columbia. Uh, this is a story about a man who is a painter and he is, he's, we're meeting him near the end of his life and he's reflecting back uh, and he's in the, in the throes of grief uh, because he has lost uh, both a son and his wife uh, and he's losing his eyesight. And so it's very poignant, very beautiful. Uh, it goes in, there's a few different places he's living, he's living in, uh, including Miami, New York City and, and Columbia. Uh, I'm enjoying it so far. I'm about maybe a tenth of the way through. And then I'm also listening to Deacon King Kong, and this is by James McBride. This is my first James McBride, and I didn't realize how wry, funny, propulsive, vibrant his writing was. Uh, this is way wittier and way funnier than I expected. It's the story of this deacon uh, in the black church in uh, Brooklyn. And it's it, the main character is in, in the throes of both dementia and drunkenness. And he shoots the local drug dealer. And that's, that, is, that thing, that, that, that event all of a sudden sparks all of these, these things and these flashbacks and all of these events and just like shatters. And we kind of follow all of these little pieces. Uh, it's dynamic and we're getting a really interesting picture of this neighborhood and this community uh, that I'm, I'm thoroughly, thoroughly enjoying. Uh, so that's what's currently on tap. And then next, next month, tomorrow, I can't believe it. Tomorrow is start of March Mystery Madness. I don't know if I'm going to be able to find everything for all of the prompts, but I 
do want to read a bunch of mysteries because I haven't really done that since December. Uh, and I'm going to focus on my mysteries from my net galley. That way I can cross two, off two, uh, two birds with one stone. But I have a ton of exciting things in my net galley uh, that I've been approved for recently, including the next uh, Deborah Levy nonfiction, the new Brandon Taylor. Uh, so there's a lot of things that I'm, I'm really excited to read, but I want to get first some of the stuff that's been sitting there because I feel very, very guilty for how poorly I mean, <laughs> I've been doing working on that. And then lastly, Invisible Cities. So if you know of any books set in Iraq, Libya, or Mexico that are an, I, ideally a woman, a woman writer, I would love to know. Most importantly, if you can find a mystery in translation from those places, uh, I will be your friend forever. Uh, so that's all I have. Thank you so much for watching. As always, unfortunately, we're coming up on a year of this damn pandemic. Uh, I hope, please, that you still maintain safe social distance. Wear two masks, wash your hands, and don't touch your face. So that's it for me for now. Thank you so much. Bye.